ADHD Rewired, episode 445. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host, and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection, and you are not alone. Go to ADHDRewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter. You can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups. Learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups. You can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Allison Lieberman. Allison is a licensed marriage and family therapist certified in postpartum mental health and new mom coach. She is the host of the New Mama Mentor Pod and helps new moms find peace and balance in their chaotic lives. Allison, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. All right. So let's kind of dive right in. So you, you have ADHD yourself. Mm-hmm, I do. <laughs> and and when, when did you learn that you had ADHD? It's sort of a complicated story, but I'll keep it short. I, I was diagnosed in high school. So like when I was about 16 and my parents were in denial of that. So I, I sort of tried a couple of medications and then ended up being like, yeah, I think I've grown out of it. You know, that whole scenario. Yeah. And then, um, After having my second child, I was talking to my therapist and telling her like my brain won't turn off. And she was like, it sounds like you have ADHD. And that sort of just opened the floodgates. So what what were (laughs) some of the things that were uh, happening at the time? Um, I was sitting in the bathtub at the end of the day. That's sort of like how I wind down at the end of my days because no one can talk to me in there. (laughs) And... (laughs) I could not turn off the to-do list in my brain because I didn't want to forget anything. And I just kept thinking like, okay, I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do this. Like, don't forget, don't forget. And of course, the second I got out, I forgot. Makes sense. Yes. <laughs> you, ever, you ever see those, um, there's a product that's actually designed to be able to write notes like in the shower? No. Um, what is it called? It's something like, shower pad or let me do a quick google search because i know that people listening are like well what is that what is it it's called aqua notes okay yeah or yeah you can and just i would use have those, my phone like, with me yeah but i once i put notes on my phone they disappear like i never see them again so it would be useless so that would actually be <laughs> beneficial aqua or notes. you just get those those crayons that are designed for the bathtub for kids and you can just use yeah. that yeah okay so um you had kind of a lot of racing thoughts yes and, uh, and then you were already a, a licensed marriage and family therapist prior to getting your ADHD diagnosis. Yes. Yeah, so I had been a therapist at that time for about five years. Okay. All right. Yeah. And when you discovered that you had ADHD, how did that change things for you as a, as a mental health professional? Well, I started to realize just how much it was impacting me. My husband also has ADHD and his is like much more of like the classic male stereotypical ADHD that we learn about in school. And so it was always like his ADHD is impacting me, but I couldn't figure out why. And then I realized that ours manifests oppositely, basically. So he needs everything sort of like in order to be able to function where I can operate very well in chaos. And I would buy every year, I would buy my planner that I would write down in. I even created my own planner one time and then never used it. It just sat there. And then I would sit there and feel so bad about it because I would stare at it. And it was just one of the many things. Because if if I had a dime for every person that told me that they created their own planner or at least like were thinking about creating their own planner, I, you know, I could buy at least a couple of candy bars. Um, totally. <laughs> okay. So after you had your, your second child, you were struggling even more. Definitely. It, it, I had her the first week of the pandemic. So that was oh. definitely a part of it. <laughs> 
So that definitely played a role. Plus I had already struggled with postpartum anxiety with my first. So it was bound to happen with the second. Okay. And it really triggered so many other things that were a little bit more manageable with one that are not manageable with two. So the, the juggling of multiple things at once, more than one person trying to get something from me at one time and sort of through this whole process, I've also learned that I have a sensory processing disorder that went undiagnosed. And so that has sort of helped me regulate some of these things that were causing the anxiety that I was having. Mm. So from a broader uh, perspective, what is the difference between postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety? Yeah, great question. I, that's the question I get the most, I think. And really it's it's the difference between like the activation in your brain, right? So the way that postpartum anxiety manifests is it's typically the intrusive thoughts or the frequent checking on the baby or the consistent fears that something bad is going to happen to the baby. So you'll find that like moms won't go outside or go to social events or especially in the pandemic era, that's heightened. Oh, it's a whole nother beast. Yeah. Or like triple checking the car seat or these, I I was talking to one person who was telling me that like their fear was like an eagle was going to come and take their baby out of there. (laughs) Right. Which is so obviously that is not going to happen, but the fear is there. It's it's really activated and the racing thoughts and all of that. So that's sort of the, the difference from the depression, which is a lot more sadness, tearfulness, the withdrawal, the isolation, all of the typical things, but it's associated with that postpartum time frame. Now, when we look at sort of the differences between anxiety and depression, you know, we're kind of looking at more of externalizing versus internalizing, right? Yeah. So... When we look at treatments, because I know that uh, there's the the idea that you know anxiety and depression are basically the just two sides of the same coin, mm-hmm. right? Would you say it's the same with postpartum anxiety and depression? Yeah, I think that they're similar. I think they're similar. I think the biggest difference in terms of like the postpartum element as opposed to just general depression and anxiety is that we feel like it's normal to be that anxious when we have a baby Mm. and it's not normal to be that depressed when we have a baby. And the truth is, is there's definitely normal elements to both. Say say that again. I think that's actually a really (laughs) like, so you're saying there's sort of this expectation of normality to be an anxious parent. Correct. A lot of times, I'll share my own experience. When I was pregnant with my daughter, my husband actually almost died. And I went to the doctor and I was like, I am losing it. (laughs) I was like, I don't know what to do. And they were like, yeah, that's normal. And I was like, okay, but like, I'm a therapist. I'm in therapy. I know the skills. Like, I'm telling you this isn't normal. And they were like, yeah, you know, just stick with it. You'll be fine. And it was like, oh, that doesn't feel good, Mm. you know? So I think that those are the types of things that happen postpartum, which is like you go to your six week checkup, which I have tons of opinions on, but, and you say like, I'm really nervous that like my baby's not gaining weight. And they're like, your baby's fine. They're gaining weight. You're fine. And then that's it. And they're not focusing on like, well, is mom not sleeping at night because she's worried that the baby's not eating? Is she so hyper-focused on the the ounces that are going in that that's all she's planning is the meals throughout the day like there's so much more nuance to it than the typical professionals that are contacting these new moms are seeing Mm -hmm. i think there's a general large awareness around postpartum depression but i think that it seems like this postpartum i mean i think that postpartum anxiety might actually be a newer term for me Right. Um, it's not in the DSM, if that helps. Hmm. <laughs> Is postpartum depression in the DSM? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's, you know, it's it, part of it seems to kind of go with this sort of cultural acceptance of like, like even some of these ideas that we like glorify uh, worrying as a parent. Like it's so unhealthy. Yes. Yeah. And what's even crazier is that, you know, we know as like mental health professionals that under the anxiety umbrella, you have generalized anxiety, OCD and PTSD. Right. But 
there's also those like subcategories in postpartum that aren't in our DSM. So somebody has a traumatic birth, which this is typically what I get in my practice is mom almost dies, baby almost dies. They weren't prepared. Their birth plan doesn't go the way they want to. That causes a trauma. And we're not informed as mental health professionals to deal with that trauma. We just sort of look at it as any other trauma, but there's a lot of nuance in that too, right? And so just the fact that the anxiety isn't even a part of our diagnostic criteria is obviously a bigger problem. So that's sort of what my goal is, is to give postpartum anxiety as much airtime as it can possibly get until someone recognizes it. So what are, you know, so we have the, the um, being a new parent is, you know, it's, uh, it's hard, right? Yeah, it's um, really hard. And, and it's funny because, uh, so I have, I have one, uh, one kiddo, uh, he's, he's going to be 11. And I probably for the first like eight years, I couldn't even imagine having another, another kid. Cause like, you know, um, my, my son is uh, on the spectrum and he has ADHD and he's highly gifted. So he's, he's exhausting. Um, yeah. great kid. He's exhausting though. Uh-huh. Um, and you know, when people would say like, it's actually less work with two kids than it is one, I'm like, but you haven't met my kid. That is um, not true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who's saying that, but it's well, not true. Well, it's, it's you know, only, I think, recently that I would say, oh, things would be actually a lot easier if he had a sibling because, like, I'm his primary playmate when he's with me, mm-hmm. you know? And so, you know, my my uh, ex and I were divorced. Um, but when, you know, you have a kiddo who is neurodivergent and an only child, right? Like, it requires a lot of attention, right? Yes. So I'm just kind of curious as to how sort of our our roles as parents, especially for new parents, plays into this, this postpartum anxiety when also ADHD is in the picture. From my own experience and what I've found in working with new moms that don't realize they have an ADHD diagnosis at the time is there's definitely the element of feeling like you're never doing enough right? Which I think is super common with ADHD is like, if I, if only I could do more then I would be successful, right? I just have to be able to do more. I know my narrative is like, if only I was more organized, then I could do things. Right. So I think that that plays a lot, especially when you transition to two is like, how do I split my time between these two tiny humans that need me when I constantly feel like my vision of success is to be able to do everything Mm. and continue to do more and put more on my plate. It's sort of like that, uh, what, what, I forget exactly what, how Brene Brown puts it, but it's like supposed to manage all the things and make it look easy. Yes. Right. It's like, oh my God, like, I think parenting is one of the hardest things ever. Like I get overwhelmed easily as a parent. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Just the noise. The noise. The noise. Nothing else. (laughs) Oh my gosh. It is. It's one of like honestly, it's one of the hardest things. Yeah. And I, I just couldn't even imagine having multiple, and they're all, you know, want something at the very same time. I, I think that I would invest in probably the highest quality noise canceling headphones that I would just permanently keep in my ears. Yes. So that's like one of my suggestions I always make is like I have the loop earplugs and. They're great because you could still hear. It's not like you're drowning out your kids and you can't tell if there's a serious thing happening, but it reduces the volume because my experience is like my brain's going to explode at some point Mm because there's too much happening. And so putting that in like really reduces that. So what is it? The loop, loop earplugs? Yeah. What is that? It's a company, actually one of my friends bought them for me because I was saying I can't stand the noise and they have two different kinds. So they're nice because they like are adjustable. You can change the like actual earpiece. They make them for DJs and stuff too, which okay. has like an extra attachment to drown out more noise. Okay, let's let's see if we can get a, uh, a link to that in, uh, in the show yeah. notes because that would be a nice resource for, for people. Um, I think I'm going to actually look into that myself. <laughs> so... You are not, you're a, a, a certified in postpartum mental health. What, so what exactly is that is the question that I'm going to ask you as soon as we come back from the break. Cause I just looked at the time and see where we're <laughs> at that time. So we're going to take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, I want to learn a little bit more about kind of how you are helping moms and parents as a, as a mental health professional with, um, with this work. So we will be right back. 
Support for ADHD Rewired comes from ADHD Rewired's award-winning coaching and accountability groups at coachingrewired.com. Are you feeling stuck or overwhelmed? Are you feeling directionless or like you're getting in your own way and want to take control of your life so you can propel yourself forward and live more intentionally with your ADHD? Then this is the coaching community you've been looking for. Join our online video-based coaching and accountability groups built for adults with ADHD by adults with ADHD. Join us for our next fall registration event on Friday, September 9th at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 Pacific. This will probably be our last evening registration event that we do. So if that is a time that works for you, be sure to register for this event. Go to coachingrewired.com to start your pre-registration process. I decided to join this group because I was stuck. Before this group, I thought I had to do this alone or with the support of other neurotypical people around me. So I decided to join because I was trying to do this uh, by myself and it just wasn't working. I decided to join this group because I had been feeling completely stuck in my life. I couldn't seem to get started and didn't know where I wanted to go or how to get there. And I realized also that I was doing more planning, maybe more thinking about it than doing, and it was very unstructured and almost random. Yeah, learning to plan. Planning was probably my biggest thing and the importance of daily planning and uh, thinking that through, whether it's the night before the day or the morning of, and then also yearly planning and uh, how much that's gonna affect me in the future. Another insight I had was I discovered I need to do my daily planning the night before instead of waiting till the morning of because when I wait, I have a much harder time making decisions and getting started. I think that I've, I've made strides that would have taken me 10 years, if not more, if I weren't in this group. Everyone here has worked so hard, been so courageous, let themselves be vulnerable, let themselves be supported by others and also just support each other. So I'm proud of all of us. My biggest takeaway is that it's okay to be me. It's okay to need support in ways that others don't. And it's okay to celebrate things that I'm proud of, no matter what anyone else thinks. Now I feel a lot more comfortable with voicing things that I need, being able to just talk about what is or is not working and not bringing too much judgment into that. The thing that I learned was I have a place in this world. What I did not expect was that other people would follow through and putting cherry tomatoes up their nose. Um, <laughs> usually it's just me. And so I was really, I knew I was among my people. To be around these people that think like I do, it's just such a relief to know that, that you're not alone, that you might not think like everybody around you, but you certainly think like a bunch of people that are in the world. I think the, the best part for me was it was a group of people who are all coming from like different backgrounds, but have like a shared experience and having ADHD, so thank you. And I just wanna thank everybody for being here because it's so powerful to just listen and be with everybody else. Take that first step by going to coachingrewired.com to get your name added to our fall interest list and join us for our upcoming fall registration event this Friday, September 9th at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 Pacific. That's 7 Central, 6 Mountain. Registration is by invitation only, so don't wait. Deadlines to submit all pre-registration submissions are at 11.59 p.m. Central, the day before our registration events. So go to coachingrewired.com to get started with your pre-registration process. Our members not only learn how to manage their calendars and create ADHD-friendly routines, they also learn how to ask better questions and communicate what they need to be successful. We've seen members change career paths, launch businesses, improve their relationships, move cross country, and so much more. It's amazing how a community who truly understands our daily struggles can have a positive impact on our lives. And our members prove that we can do hard things and we don't have to do them alone. Go to coachingrewired.com to add your name to our fall interest list to join us this fall 2022 or listening to this in the future, check out coachingrewired.com to get the most up-to-date information on our upcoming season coaching groups. Come grow with us at coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com. All right, we are back with Allison Lieberman. Allison, so right before the break, I uh, was asking you to talk a little bit more about what it means to be a certified postpartum mental health. Yeah, so uh, Postpartum Support International is sort of like the overarching agency for that. And their website is postpartum.net. 
they have a perinatal mental health certification that you can get. And when I was struggling with postpartum anxiety with my son is when I sort of discovered it. It spans from prior to conception all the way through postpartum. I've sort of chosen the postpartum time frame, but it, it really teaches it's not solely for mental health professionals, but that's part of it. It teaches doctors, midwives, nurses, peer support specialists, anybody in any realm of the touch points for new moms to be able to have that education around the specific qualities that come out in these mental health pieces. So that's sort of how you learn that the, about postpartum psychosis and postpartum depression and all of those things that maybe you touch on in school, maybe not depends on the yeah. school you went to. Um, yeah. So that's sort of what the certification is. And then, you know, just through, I, I learned so much with that certification, but then also, of course, as most of us know that have our niches, like you learn so much more when you start to work with the population itself mm -hmm. and just the different categories within that. So what are some of the things that you've been learning since you've been doing this? Yeah, well, I think especially in the ADHD realm of postpartum, we know that ADHD and depression and anxiety can definitely come up, especially when you haven't been diagnosed, mm -hmm. right? And so that, I think, heightens the postpartum experience when you don't know that you have the diagnosis or you think you do, but everybody's told you you don't. And then you're experiencing the overwhelm and you're experiencing some of the sensory input issues like the overtouched, outtouched piece when you're breastfeeding and you have more than one kid or even the one kid and they just want to touch you all the time and that's overstimulating and you're just like, I need a break. So it's sort of learning through my own experience how I got overstimulated and then also was able to cope with it. But then what works for different people? Because things that work for me don't work for everybody. I'm curious as far in this in the sensory piece, because Something that I've been curious about for just for myself for a while is, have I, am I more aware of just sort of the sensory integration kind of stuff like looks like, or has it actually just gotten worse the older I've gotten? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. It, my, my process of like this whole sensory thing, I've always known I've had sensory issues, but I was sort of labeled as picky and weird. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I've always had issues with food and there's only certain safe foods and not safe foods and that whole thing. Right. And everybody has said, you're just really picky. I would say in the last six months, I've realized that I have a sensory processing mm. issue because I started to just accept that this is who I am and that I'm not weird. Mm. And that's hard too, right. To just accept that. And I think there's elements that I didn't notice when I was younger, but I also didn't have kids. So that's sort of like the hard part. Like noise hasn't always bothered me. Smells have always bothered me. Mm -hmm. So having kids, I already knew that smell was going to be an issue, but the noise wasn't an issue until I had too much of it. Mm -hmm. That was out of my control. Maybe, yeah. maybe that's the mm -hmm. Yeah, I know the, the sensory piece, I, I've, I've been saying for a while that I think it's one of the most under talked about sort of aspects of ADHD. It's not even included in the DSM as an associated feature, but like this also research that shows that you can't have a sensory processing disorder alone, like whether it's it's ADHD, uh, autism spectrum disorder, which is, you know, it, it just needs to be more research on this, but it's... Uh, Man, it's when we start talking about this in, in sort of in groups and in community settings, there's so many people going, that's part of the ADHD. It's, it's like, well, kind of like yeah. we're all sort of experiencing this, right? Um, and especially with the the sound. I mean, and, and people do uh, experience that in, in much different ways. And it sounds like uh, we, we may be pretty similar uh, with that realm of like, I see that you're wearing some, a Bose uh, noise canceling headphones. Do you uh -huh. tend to wear those like always? When I'm working, yeah, I have um, like the Apple AirPods too, mm -hmm. but I do find that over time I like it bugs my ears and mm -hmm. then I have to switch. But like another thing that happens that is a recent discovery is like when I'm watching TV, I enjoy it way more if I have my AirPods in. 
just having them in or having that like where they were you're actually the volume is the, the volume is in my airpods okay. cuz then i can like actually hear it at the volume that i want to hear it and not like have to it's like a whole process but i definitely don't think i would have been able to figure that out if i didn't accept that the sensory piece was there mm, interesting does that make sense mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right so what about um when you you're working with with uh new moms and like the, the thing that I'm always just like I'm so grateful that I'm am, am a man because the thought of having to not like to go off my medication to get pregnant and like I was like oh my god like I, I like life would be a dumpster fire right like mm-hmm. how do you support people who have been on ADHD meds and then, you know, cause you know, and I have heard that when you get pregnant, the hormones change. And so sometimes for some people, uh, the, the, their ADHD symptoms tend to not be as significant sometimes. Yeah. But I'm sure that's not always the case. So we talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So it's interesting because I think a lot of the women that I see that have ADHD and postpartum anxiety or depression haven't been diagnosed so they don't necessarily know the whole medication piece yet, okay. right? But I will say that medication during pregnancy and postpartum in general, whether it's ADHD medication, antidepressants, anxiety medications is a hot topic. Mm-hmm. It's, it's sort of one of those things like I am so passionate about people seeing reproductive psychiatrists that are far and few between. <laughs> I'm, I'm- sort of surprised like I don't think I've ever heard even that as a reproductive psychiatrist and that that makes sense that that would be a, a thing yeah so they're typically trained through PSI they do more work in understanding the research behind how medications interact with breastfeeding and with pregnancy and of course with any medication there's a risk right But I know when I got pregnant the second time I went to my OB and they had, I wasn't on ADHD medication yet at that time, but I was on antidepressants and she was like, you have to get off of these right away. And I was like, or else what? Like, what's going to happen? Like, it's terrible for the baby. You have to get off of them right away. And so I panicked, of course. And I was like, okay. And then It turns out I was on Zoloft, which typically is safe during pregnancy. So yeah, you would think that an OB would know what's safe and what isn't and what is a realistic response to that and what isn't. So yeah, reproductive psychiatrists exist. There aren't very many of them. They typically don't accept insurance. So there's all of those pieces. But my best advice to somebody who's taking any of these medications is to find somebody, even if it's just one session that they have to pay out of pocket for. I know it's a lot of money, but like to get the right advice on how to move forward, I think is the best thing that you could do for yourself and for your baby, right? Because we know scientifically that if you're stressed and there's anxiety and then cortisol is being released into your system, then that's going to the baby, right? And so if your ADHD medication can regulate that, then how do we decide what's best? So for for moms who are um, thinking about getting pregnant, um, what are some of the things that they can maybe go to their doctors with to maybe think that, oh, you got to get off uh, medications. What can they, you know, go to that doctor and say, well, actually, you know, there's, even if it's not a huge body of research, there's some supporting evidence that says, well, if when well-managed, like these medications can be okay. Um, so what, what do you know about that? Not a lot, I'll be honest. Okay. <laughs> I wish that I could say more, but I, I'm i not super knowledgeable of all of the medications that are safe during pregnancy. I would say that probably the biggest concern is like the stimulant aspect of that. And I know that there's ADHD medications that are not stimulants, right? Sometimes, you know, we have the medications that can regulate certain symptoms that are more what's the word I'm looking for, Um, impactful Mm -hmm. than other ones, right? So if nothing else, being able to identify like this is the symptom that makes my life a lot harder and Mm. I don't know how I'd be able to manage, how can I tackle that symptom? Mm. So how do you help people uh, when you're coaching them? Because I know you also do 
coaching for, for new moms? Yeah. So part of it is like, I think the biggest part of sort of that transition into parenthood in general, right. I'm sure you can relate to this in some way is what you thought being a parent was going to be like versus (laughs) what your actual experience is. Uh Right. And I think that that is something that evolves at every stage of your child's life. Right. So, you know, you're sort of anticipating the terrible twos and then you're like, well, my kid's not that bad. But when they hit three, it's a disaster. Right. Yeah, I, so, I love that idea. Like whoever, uh, whoever it's, you know, says the terrible twos are bad. Never met a three year old. Yes. <laughs> and like, do the terrible twos start at two? Not really. They start earlier. So it's just like a whole thing. Right. So really redefining, like, what is your reality now that you are a parent? What does that look like? How do you accept that it's not what you thought it was going to be? How do you grieve the loss of this older version of you that doesn't exist anymore? I think another sort of nuanced piece that comes up for moms mostly is, you know, body image stuff around. You're never going to go back to that pre-baby body because you had the baby, right? So how do you learn to accept your body for what it's like and learn to appreciate what it's created in some capacity and what it's been able to go through? Not every single person on the planet can birth a child, right? And so that's something that we need to appreciate about our bodies and ourselves and our lives. So that's definitely like the foundational work and then working on as well, like the, how were you parented working on that element too? And how does that kind of come into your current parenting and, and then all the skills to manage that. A lot of it pulls from like CBT stuff as well. Cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. No, it's funny when you, when you uh, were saying that, you know, accepting that you don't have this this pre-baby uh body and this person was able to like you know uh, support this human life you know it's to me i think it honestly it's one of the the most like just amazing things i've ever witnessed in my entire life was the birth of my son like yeah oh my god the human body is incredible it's incredible like i grew people <laughs> But like I'm, I, my body was able to do that and that's great. And I should appreciate it instead of punishing it. Right. And I think that, I think one of the things I've sort of learned in this ADHD journey is like, there's a lot of that societal push to punish yourself. Right. Yeah. And to punish yourself for being different or not part of the quote unquote norm that has been established. And it's okay to accept these unique versions of yourself that make you who you are. Mm. How do you differentiate between, um, you know, symptoms of maybe like even trauma related to childbirth and cause you know, trauma is one of those things that can look a lot like ADHD um, mm-hmm. and how it presents. So like how, how do you help sort of figure out that differential uh, diagnosis? It, I think it's easier than it seems only because like, If it's the trauma, you could kind of pinpoint when it started. Like, did you have any of these issues prior to that? I would say 99% of the time, somebody that has ADHD that's coming in and doesn't know has always had issues with something, Mm -hmm. right? So one woman I'm currently working with, like she's always had issues with being organized and being able to not hyper focus on everything all the time, right? Like she sort of checks out of things and gets stuck in the hyper fixation element. And she thought that it was just an ebb and flow between motivation and laziness. Mm. And I find that a lot too, like with the the ADHD mindset that you're lazy, yeah. that comes up a lot in people's narratives. Yeah. It's and that's one of those not big trigger words for me. I'm like, ooh, yes, I'm like, I hate it. Yes. <laughs> Yes, it's like anytime thinking, someone says lazy, I'm like, we can't talk about that. Yeah, because it's like thinking about all the things you need to do on repeating your mind, but not doing it. That's not lazy. That's executive dysfunction. Yes, exactly. Right, when you exactly. know what to do, but you're not doing it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so what have you found to be some of the most helpful things that, as both personally for yourself as well as with the clients you're working with who have ADHD, in sort of navigating this just challenging, uh, both exciting, but also challenging uh, phase of life. It's interesting because I was on one of your Q&A calls a couple months ago and someone had brought up that they heard ADHD was their superpower. And there's a lot of mixed emotions about that. 
And I, I don't generally think anybody has like a superpower, but something that's worked for me is like, when I'm hyper-focused on something, I'm amazing at whatever that thing is. (laughs) Like I'm 120% in and that's it. And when I'm not hyper-focused on it, it doesn't exist to me anymore. And so I know that when I've sort of leaned into my hyper-fixation, I've accepted that like, I can get this thing done and that's great. And I won't look at it again for a while, but I'm getting it done now and not beating myself up for not finishing something and not going back to it or maintaining it, but just accepting that like when I'm in it, I'm in it. And when I'm not, I'm not, and I'm hyper-focused on something else and I will make my rounds, right? It's sort of that acceptance piece of like, that's how my brain works. Yeah. And no amount of medication is going to help me not hyper-fixate mm. on something. <laughs> mm. So that's part of it. And then the other side of that, right, is that sort of laziness element that we hear which is like, there's going to be days where I am not interested in doing all the stuff that I had planned. And that's okay too, because tomorrow I might be hyper fixated on it. Mm. Do you think there's been any, like for, for you, has there been any changes in sort of that tendency to get into the hyper focus pre versus post uh, postpartum? Yes. So it's funny. I have a friend who's sort of going through the process of getting diagnosed potentially and she, I was telling her that I had this like vision in my head because I also tend to have like these thoughts of like, I could do a lot of things when I'm hyper focused on something. So I was like, I really want to make my kids play area into a pirate ship. And prior I would have done that. I would have actually gone out and bought all the stuff and made, not actually successfully made this pirate ship, but I would have definitely tried. <laughs> it definitely would have sunk. But, yeah, uh... it would have been terrible. And I probably would have stopped halfway through and been like, why did I do this? Like that was, I know that I can't do that, right? But now I can take a step back and be like, that's a great idea for somebody else to do and not you. <laughs> that doesn't make me a bad mom that I can't do that it makes me a better mom that I can accept that and present to them with a different opportunity that doesn't take my time away. It sounds like the uh, description of the fantasized version of myself that I have was really Uh handy and can like fix and build all these things that are in my head. But the real real version of myself knows that I just do not have that skill set. No, not yet anyways. (laughs) Yeah. All right, let's let's take a quick break, and uh, when we come back, I want to hear a little bit about your uh, your podcast and uh, and any other tips that you uh, are excited to share with with our listeners. So we will be right, right back. Hey there, ADHD Rewired listeners. If you are new to this podcast, did you know that there are actually other podcasts that we have here on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network? Go to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast network to find all of our shows, including ADHD Essentials with Brandon Pan, Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curb, and ADHD Diversified with MJ Siemens. And did you know you can join me and the rest of the ADHD Rewired team for our live Q&A every second Tuesday of the month? Get registered to join on Zoom by going to ADHD Rewired dot com slash events. Our next live Q&A is next week on September 13th at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. That's next Tuesday, September 13th at 12.30 p.m. Central. It's always the same time, same week of the month. Find out more about ADHD Rewired at ADHDrewired.com slash podcast. Consider leaving a rating and review in your favorite podcast player. If you enjoy this podcast and find value in this show and share it on your social media feeds with people you know in your support groups. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss our newest episodes every week. And go to ADHDrewired.com where you can find this podcast and all of our shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Also, we may be having one or two new podcasts come this fall. Just throwing it out there. Watch this space to find out if it happens. That's ADHDrewired.com. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our patrons at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. You could support this podcast and get perks like ad-free episodes starting at just $5 a month and support can start at any amount that makes sense to you. 
you want to get a little taste of group coaching, then consider joining our Patreon community at just $25 a month, where you can join me for our patron-only coaching call every fourth Tuesday of the month at 3 p.m. Central. Don't want to miss what we talk about in that monthly coaching call? For $10 a month, you can get the audio recordings of our monthly coaching call in our private RSS feed. It works the same as a podcast. You just have to set it up through Patreon, and then you take a special link and bring it into your podcast player. And just as a reminder, once you signed up, patrons at $5 a month or more, make sure you get your private RSS feed set up. Click on the membership tab on the Patreon website. Don't use the app. Use either your phone browser or your computer to set up your RSS feed. And you'll find directions for connecting your RSS feed to your favorite podcast app, unless that favorite podcast app is Spotify, because they don't offer support for private RSS feeds. I don't fully know how that technology works, but that's what I understand. So thank you for all of our patrons for your support. Whether you want to support us because you want the extra perks or you want to support us because you want to support the work we are doing. And it's a way that you could say thank you. Become a patron if you're able to at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon or click the Patreon tab at the top of the page. And to all of our supporters, thank you so much for supporting us. It really does help us do a lot of the things that we are trying to do. So thank you. All right, we are back with Allison Lieberman. All right, so your podcast, The New Mama Mentor. Yes. Tell us about it. Yeah, so it sort of stemmed from the mindset that, you know, I... I love and hate Google. It's a love hate relationship. So and Google, yes. Okay. <laughs> because it's it, it you access so much information that's great, but not all of it is good information or information that is accurate, right? So I wanted to create a space where moms of, at any stage can really access the information that is necessary for whatever they're going through. So it it sort of started with, I wish that I got like a binder of some sort that mm-hmm. someone would have handed me when I left the hospital and said, please don't read this right now. But when you have something come up, skip to the page and here's all the resources that are available to you. You know, obviously that's a lot of ins and outs that I can't conquer. So I started a podcast. <laughs> so it's really just to sort of create the awareness that there are the resources out there. A lot of, uh, for lack of a better term, the medical gaslighting happens around all of this stuff. And so like- Will, will you define form, that medical gaslighting? Yeah. So it's similar to what we were talking about before, but like either it's in your head or what you're talking about isn't a big deal or yeah, that sucks, but it's normal. Those types of things happen a lot to women at all stages in their journey. Um, I've had it happen to me in a few different areas, but like pelvic floor health is a huge part of that where women are sort of told that the pain that they experience or if they sneeze and they leak urine, that that's normal. And you just have to live with that for the rest of your life. And the truth is, is that's not the case. Mm. And the only way that you know that is if you find that information. And so I want to create the awareness around all of those things so that women know that those things are available and they're not quote unquote normal. Mm. How long have you been doing the podcast? Not long. (laughs) I started it in March. Um, And it's been great, like in terms of the people that want to get the word out. I think that's been wonderful. And in my true form, I woke up and was like, I think I'm going to start a podcast today. And then I realized how much work that took. And so (laughs) I finally gotten it together and uh, now things are settled. But yeah. Okay. So we're we're recording this on uh, July uh, 14th, 2022. How many episodes uh, do you have out? 15. Okay. So yeah. you're, you're past that first sort of threshold before pod fade. If they say like the majority of podcast, like 50% of podcasters who make it past uh, 15 episodes will uh, have a, it's a greater likelihood for like a, a long run. And then if you make it past 25, it's you're in a even uh, smaller pool of people who actually have a long run on the podcast. So keep going. Interesting. Keep going. Yeah. I mean, I have, I, I record a lot, so I have way more than 25 recorded. So 
it's just the editing part, as you know. So um, I have an editor, which has helped. Good. Have you had that from the beginning or is it something that you recently uh, brought on? Recently, yeah. <laughs> I had to try it and see if I could manage it. I, I think can't. that's I think that's an important thing to know how to do. Um, yes. Yeah, it's uh, hiring hiring editors for, for this kind of stuff is, uh, man, because I, I like the editing, but that's, that's actually where I get into hyper-focus. Yes. And it's just like, okay, like the type of editing that I'm doing, like not necessary. No one really cares about like how I adjust frequencies of yeah. someone's mm-hmm. voice. Like it's only I care, right? Yeah. I'm like, ooh, it, just because it can be done doesn't mean that it should be done, right? Yeah, uh-huh. um, so, absolutely. And <laughs> listening to my voice that much also, like that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I get to listen to myself all day. So are there any other sort of tools that that uh, you would, you know, encourage people to look into tools or other support networks for new moms who may be experiencing some postpartum anxiety or postpartum depression or just new parents with ADHD? Yeah. So there's a great book by, I mean, Karen Kleinman in general is great. She has written tons of postpartum books. She wrote, um, Good Moms Have Scary Thoughts, which is a great one, especially it's a great if title. you have, yes. And it's great if you have ADHD too, not because she necessarily focuses on it, but um, it only comes in book form, which I am like an audio book person. I'm not a physical book person, but it's like a picture book too. Uh, so nice. it's like really tackleable and it comes with its own bookmark. So like it's nice. great for all for types aesthetic. of brains. Great. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> so okay. that's one book that she wrote. She also wrote, um, This Isn't What I Expected, which is about postpartum depression. There's the postpartum husband. So for partners who aren't sure like what's happening or how to help, it's a great book. And it's also a short book. It's like 130 pages. So it's a really easy to digest book. And then for people that are having their second baby and they already struggled, she wrote, um, oh, shoot, I'm blanking on the name. What am I thinking? Is the name of the book. <laughs> which is a great title as well. So those are great books that I love. And I think one thing that I recommend that is usually like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that, but journaling really does help. Even if it's not every day, if you are like ruminating on something over and over and over again, Mm -hmm. writing it down is like really helpful. Even if you just toss it. (laughs) It's it's true. I I have such a love hate relationship with journaling. It's like, I hate doing it. And like, I love how helpful it is, which also makes me hate it even more because it's yeah. like, it is so helpful and I just don't enjoy it like ever. Yeah. Right. But yeah. yeah, it's like, it's one of these things where it's like, oh man, I didn't even realize I was thinking that until like it, you know, until I wrote it out. Yes. Yes. There, Go ahead. There, you there was, ask yeah. Question. So, um, you know, there's, there's one, uh, I think area that, that I, uh, we haven't really talked about and that's uh, the partners of New Mouse. Yeah. What are some things that are, that could be helpful for partners who are supporting uh, a new mom um, who might be going through, you know, some of these things? Yeah. So the number one thing that I hear moms say they need from their partner is not achievable, but I'm going to put it out there is that they be able to read their minds and just know what they need. So I sort of interpret that as like, Try to pay attention to areas that you see are not getting met. So like if you see that the dishes keep piling up, like just taking the initiative to do the dishes, right? Or if you know how to do laundry, like throw a load of laundry in. Like those are the types of things that, especially in that like first three months, they don't want to have to think about. Um, So any sort of initiative taking is great. I also know that that's hard. So if nothing else, to just acknowledge and appreciate. I would tell my husband when I was breastfeeding in the middle of the night, I would get so angry staring at him sleeping. (laughs) And I'd be like, why am I awake? And you're not, even though he couldn't breastfeed. And I realized that like what I really needed was just for him to say, thank you. Mm. Like when I'm up and he's like rolling over and he sees me like, just say, thank you. That's what I need. I know it seems silly and small, but it made a huge difference when I communicated that to him. So it's like small little gestures that can really go a long way. And what about on the other side of it? Like for the partners, what what are some things like, don't do this. <laughs> Don't tell them to calm down ever. <laughs> There's 
there's a viral uh, TikTok video of this woman who's like in active labor, like crowning and her husband's like, relax. <laughs> and like everybody like. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Like, no. And like not saying like it's not a big deal. I think like being able to say, you know, I could see that this is really making you anxious. Like, what can we do to make you feel better about this? Like, that would be a great thing. Something that I did in the beginning is I would write down like things that make me anxious and put them on the fridge so that my husband would be able to see like, I know not all of these things are realistic, but they make me anxious and I need you to see that I'm anxious about them. And that helped too, because it was like me telling him without me having to tell him and he could see what was going on in my brain. So a few weeks ago, Roe was overturned. Uh Uh-huh. How has that affected the work you're doing? Oh, a lot. I would imagine. Um, (laughs) I'm in California. So in that sense, like it's a positive because, you know, it's a very supportive state in terms of abortion and women's rights and all of that. So in that sense, it's, it's positive. But I think on the other end, there's a lot of fear. I have two clients that both almost died from their birth experiences. Mm. And the last thing they would want in the world is to get pregnant. And it creates a lot of fear and re-traumatization and a lack of choice. And nothing is worse for anxiety than feeling like you don't have a choice or you feel out of control of your own life. And it's, definitely been a a huge hit to the community in general. Mm -hmm. I'm in a lot of Facebook groups with people from other states. And I just saw a terrible article today about a child who had to go to another state because she had to get an abortion and there wasn't support for her. And I think it's, it's really sad. I'm sad for women and I'm sad for the kids that really yeah. it's going to impact the most. Yeah. It's, um, it's, you know, I'm already anticipating uh, the, the responses I might get for, for you mean touching political stuff, but like I'm a social worker, like it, it is our yeah. domain. Right. Um, and it's just the, I think the, the unintended consequences I think are just beginning to be seen. Oh. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, we could probably do a whole podcast on that topic, but that's, I'm not sure that's, this is the right place for, uh, for that. <laughs> you could come on my podcast and we'll do that topic. <laughs> I, I would, I'd love to, I'd love to. Um, <laughs> all right. So, uh, your website, it's RI counseling. Is that right? All right. Counseling.com. R-I-H counseling. Dot com. And, uh, where else can people kind of learn more about you? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram at the new mama mentor or rooted in hard rooted in harmony counseling. We have two Instagrams and the new mama mentor podcast on Apple podcasts, Spotify, all those fun places. And yeah. Allison, thank you so much for, uh, for doing the work that you're doing and for uh, spending this time with us. Yeah. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons can join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tivers. 
You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tivers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person, and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.